Hello fellow mech warriors, Mage Leader here, and welcome back to another installment of whatever the fuck these videos are supposed to be. I apologize in advance if you hear bumps in the night, as it were, weird sounds coming from around me. I live in an apartment building, and, uh, my neighbors, well, yeah, <laughs> our neighbors. So there might be some noises going on in the background, I hope you'll excuse some of that, but... I'm back with you guys today because there's something that came to my mind and I thought I should probably, you know, put my two cents in on it. So, we all know at this point, we discussed ad nauseum the whole uh, 40k diaspora situation. I'm not going to talk much more about that specifically, but what it does mean is that there's a bunch of new people coming into this hobby. And so I thought it would be a good idea to have some content out there to kind of help initiate them into this universe. So... I've got my Battle Mech Primer uh, videos, which are produced content on the different types of mech, trying uh, different types of mechs, trying to be a bit more informative and entertaining. They're mostly designed around people who already know the basics of the lore. So I'd like to start making some more lore-based videos to kind of cover the plot of BattleTech as well. So that's something that hopefully is coming in the near future, but. Uh, until I get those sorts of things out, I thought that it'd be a good idea to say, how do you get started with uh, Battletech? One of the first things that anybody does when they start one of these uh, big tabletop war games is they want to pick a faction. They want to find, you know, the group that they want to play as, which, you know, that's going to dictate, like, what your paint schemes are and, you know, what what types of mechs you buy. They're not... Not super much, because you can you can basically throw any mechs anywhere and just say, eh, the, the, yeah, we've got all clan mechs, but we stole them or we won them in in combat or whatever. But, you, you know, for the most part, it's fairly ubiquitous. But you can still, like, have themed armies based around what, which faction you pick. And there's a lot of factions in Battletech, and they're very different from each other. So it can be a little daunting when you go in. So what I want to talk about today is how to pick your first Battletech faction. Now, it doesn't have to be your only faction, as I'm sure I don't have to tell anybody that. You can bounce around between them just fine, or you can decide you don't like one as much as you used to and move on to another, and that's kind of the neat thing about Battletech, is that if you choose to change your mind, it's a fairly simple affair to, you know, repaint your mechs if you want to, or don't. Nobody will really care that much if they're the wrong color scheme. But, you know, if you want to do that, you can just repaint the mechs and switch over to a completely different uh, type of uh, faction to dive into and enjoy. So don't feel like you have to get locked into something. So I'm going to cover kind of like the basics of the different uh, great houses and the, the major players in the inner sphere and kind of what they're all about. Uh, I'll go more into more detail about the clans in a future video because there's a lot of clans and they're all very different from each other as well. They kind of, they're almost their own category. So this is more for the Inner Sphere factions prior to uh, 3052, so more like your 3025 time period. And uh, I'll explain more about the time periods in another video as well, but um, the, there's really, the basics of, gist of it is that there's two big time periods in Battletech. Like, there's others too that kind of fall around the edges, but the two biggest ones that people tend to play in, in my experience, are 3025 and 3052. So 3025 is... Uh, Fourth Succession War, 3052, is the clan invasion. Those are kind of the big, uh, the two really big time periods that people play in. That will dictate what kind of mechs you can bring and uh, what factions are in play at the time. So we're going to kind of stick to those for the basics, in, at least in this video. I can go into more detail about other things in the future, but there's plenty of content here for us to discuss so let's just hop right into it. So in 3025, uh, the Inner Sphere is broken up into uh, several different factions, and it's it's kind of the most stable that it's been. So you've got the Great Houses, you've got a couple of uh, territories, and then you've got the Periphery Nations. So I'm going to be pulling up a map of the Inner Sphere as I'm talking about this on screen, you can kind of follow along there. Alright, so first up on the chopping block is going to be the Lyran Commonwealth, uh, sometimes referred to as House Steiner. 
So the Lyran Commonwealth is one of the bigger of the great houses. Uh, they are possibly the wealthiest faction. These guys are known... The meme around them is that they're the Space Germans, and they are Germanic in a lot of different ways. A lot of their uh, language is Terran German. They're a mercantile group of people, so they're like the big tradespeople of the inner sphere. They regulate a lot of the commerce, they have the big coffers, they have the expensive stuff, the fancy stuff. They are also one of the more... Um, medieval feeling i guess of the great houses they have like the royal families and the noble families and all this other stuff uh their military is organized in such a way that uh, your position in the military is determined by who your daddy is as opposed to how good you are at actually commanding your troops so there's a lot of uh social generals in the uh lyran commonwealth which often leads to the meme about them using assault mechs as scouts the prevailing military doctrine for some of these generals has been, you know, bigger is always better. So just throw the big mechs at things until the problem goes away. That's the meme. It's not entirely accurate, but it's not entirely inaccurate either. It's just kind of... It's kind of how they do things. They like to go big or go home. They like to hit hard with as many things as they can. They're, they're not subtle about things. They're very upfront, very... Um, very very punchy compared to the other factions. So if you like a more straightforward faction where you just have a big army with lots of giant stompy things, the Lyran Commonwealth is one of the best places to be. So, next to them, uh, in the upper right corner of the Inner Sphere, is the Draconis Combine. This is the Weeb faction. If you like anime, this is where you go. So, <laughs> the Draconis Combine uh, is primarily based off of uh, sort of like this weird fictionalized version of uh, feudal Japan. So they've got the Bushido code and they've got, you know, the, the samurai and the, sh the shogun and all that other crazy stuff. Uh, the society is based a lot around honor, quote unquote, uh, because the Draconis Combine's version of honor is very different from a lot of other people's. These guys are known for kind of being assholes. Uh, they will invade a place, and they are not nice to people who aren't them. They are very snooty, high and mighty, superior feeling type of people. They look down their nose at everybody else, and if your world gets conquered by them, you can look forward to a decent amount of oppression. At this time, uh, in 3025, they have control over the Rosselhog district, for the most part, and... Uh, as a Rosselhog fan myself, I gotta tell you, it's not nice. So Rosselhog would be the area between uh, Steiner and Draconis Combine space normally, but on this map it doesn't appear because it's currently being run by the Draconis Combine and they're just being giant dicks about everything. So if you like committing war crimes in the name of honor and uh, having a strict code that you follow you know, intensive laws of almost kind of chivalry, and you, you like that whole uh, feudal Japanese system, then this is a good place to go. In terms of how they fight, typically uh, their idea of how you do things is uh, the bonsai charge. That's the meme around them. It's all about just throwing everything at your enemy with reckless abandon, until you eventually come out on top because you have more bodies than they have bullets. Uh, there's a sort of ritualistic way to how they approach combat. Everything needs to be done a certain way, or else it's not worth doing. So if you like the idea of having a set of rules by which you, you conduct yourself, and the whole Japanese aesthetic, the whole, or you just like the color red, then <laughs> the Draconis Combine is a good place for you. Next up, in the lower right-hand corner, is House Davian. These guys are often portrayed as kind of like the goody two-shoes faction of the Inner Sphere. Uh, they have their dark moments as well, but for the most part, these it's clearly the writer's favorite faction most of the time. Uh, a lot of the big heroes come from House Davian and the Federated Sons. So, this is where you go if you like basically winning all the time. Uh, they're kind of the more vanilla faction, I guess you could say, 
out of the bunch. Their culture is loosely based on some more uh, French aspects, but not as much as the other factions tend to be. They're kind of the most straightforward. So if you're not looking to get super involved with like the technical aspects of other factions and dive into like this complex social structure and the pecking order and where everybody fits into where and how that determines you know, how everything gets organized, Davian is pretty... It, it makes a lot of sense. You can just kind of slide into it fairly easily. This is where a lot of people go that just kind of want to build a force and have it be just that force. So next to them, in kind of that center section of the lower portion of the map, is House Liao and the Capellan Confederation. If you're at all familiar with Star Trek, think of these guys as the Romulan Star Empire. These are your stereotypical mustache twirling bad guys most of the time. Um, that's not to say that there aren't good people there or that they don't do noble things on occasion. They do. But for the most part, uh, in terms of how they're written, these guys are behind basically everything that goes wrong because the meme is that the Capellan's favorite sheath for his dagger is your back. You can't trust a Capellan to do anything because they're always out for their own interests and eventually they will shank you to get ahead. These guys are more uh, Asian influenced, but if I, if I had to pick a nation that they're kind of inspired by, it would probably be Communist China and or North Korea. This is a great place to go if you're one of those people who likes to say that uh, true communism has never been tried. Perfect spot for you. Uh, welcome to the Capellan Confederation. Enjoy your stay. Their military is similar to the Draconis Combine in that they like large numbers of kind of, I guess you could say, cheaper machines. Not always the case, but that's kind of how I summarize it typically. Uh, it's all about your loyalty to the supreme leader as well as your loyalty to the state. So it's all about the state in House Liao. If you want to get anywhere, it's all about how loyal you are to the party, and that's where all of your reputation and positioning comes from. It's all rooted in the party system of House Liao. So next to them, in that lower left-hand portion of the map, is the Free Worlds League ruled over by House Merrick. Now, a lot of people will try to tell you that this is Space America, don't listen to those people. They don't know what they're talking about. This place is not like America, hardly at all. It's... I can see where the comparison comes from, because it's the it's more divided up into a bunch of smaller states inside the bigger one. There's a bunch of factions, but they aren't unified in quite the same way. These guys like to beat the ever-living shit out of each other, and they're just as happy to do so as they are to fight anybody else. It's very rare to get them to actually band together for anything. They're always backstabbing each other and trying to get ahead and become the biggest, you know, baddest group of people in the Free Worlds League. So what it more closely resembles is like the Balkans or maybe the Holy Roman Empire. They kind of have that mentality that you get when you read about Scandinavian history where you know, they will beat the crap out of each other and kill each other by the thousands, but if somebody else comes out and starts picking on one of the other states, it, it's like siblings, you know, like, hey, you can't pick on him, that's my job. So they, they're they knit together in that way, where people who are from outside the Free Worlds League aren't allowed to pick on them, but they will absolutely nuke each other into oblivion whenever they get the chance. So if you like fiercely independent type of people who can't seem to agree on anything other than somebody in the room is wrong, House Merrick is a good place to be. So they also have a lot, they basically have everybody's toys because of, there's been so much fighting in that area that it's just, you can't even start to understand all the craziness that's gone down there. It's technically all documented, but good luck trying to figure all that stuff out. It's a long history of people just doing crazy stuff. So that's House Merrick. A lot of people like it just because it's where all the action is all the time. There's never a dull moment in the Free Worlds League. So moving on from there, those are the, the big, great houses. We'll move into some of the territories. Now, you can't see it on this map. I briefly mentioned Rosselhog before. 
Russell Hogg is something that you'll see more in the 3040s when they regain their independence from House Kirita. And that kind of tells you a little bit about Russell Hogg. Again, that's in that sort of upper middle portion of the map. If you took where uh, the Capellan Confederation is and flipped it to the other side, that's more or less where Russell Hogg is. So Russell Hogg is kind of like Space Poland because they're situated between two of the biggest great houses that absolutely cannot stand each other. So, they get invaded a lot. They've been invaded by Steiner, they've been invaded by Curita, they've been invaded by basically everybody at one point or another. Their culture is based on a big resistance feeling. They're fiercely independent, and they always want to like earn their freedom from everybody, and... There's a lot of insurgencies and resistance movements, and anybody who spends a decent amount of time of their uh, occupying their territory eventually gives up and leaves, just because it's Russell Hogg and good luck. <laughs> so they're they're my favorite faction because they're kind of the underdog of the setting. Everyone's picking on them all the time, but they always seem to come back until 3052, where they basically cease to exist, and then they get changed forever and aren't worth even talking about anymore. But we don't. We don't need to talk about the Dark Age or anything like that. Um, <laughs> we all just pretend that doesn't exist over here. So, Russell Hogg's culture is based a lot on sort of the uh, Scandinavian roots. I believe that the language that they speak is actually Swedish, though there is a dialect that begins to pop up during the Draconis Combine's occupation, which is sort of a combination of Swedish and Japanese. Nobody knows what it sounds like. Nobody knows how it works. It, it doesn't make any sense, but it's there. But uh, after the Draconis Combine gets kicked out, they kind of, they want to get rid of all the Curitan aspects of their culture that they've been forced to absorb over the years. So they start to push that stuff aside. But that's what Russell Hogg is. It's all about oh, these guys are in charge of us now? Well, we hate them and we're going to we're gonna stab their troops while they sleep type of thing. So from there, we move on to the periphery states. Now, the periphery is, as the name implies, the area around the edge of the inner sphere. There's a few different kingdoms here. And kingdoms in the periphery are almost never stable. They rise and they fall. So when you talk about what's here you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt because these things, they, sh they shift all the time and they're moving all over the place. This is where you go if you want to create your own l small kingdom. You do it in the periphery, you have it pop up and just kind of be a thing for your specific time period. So the big players in the periphery uh, will start with the magistracy, magistracy, I hate that word, the magistracy of Canopus or can opener as some people like to call it. This is Space Vegas. They are a nation that loves providing entertainment services to the other uh, bigger nations in the inner sphere because there's a lot of money to be made there. It's how they've basically stayed alive throughout all of the crazy stuff that's happened in history. Nobody really wants to get rid of Canopus because they like the services that they provide and they're willing to turn a blind eye to a lot of the stuff that they do because, well, it's Space Vegas. What happens in Space Vegas stays in Space Vegas. You just kind of leave them alone and let them do their own thing. It's kind of a twisted place at times. But uh, it's it's a good place to go if you like that sort of grungy, dirty capitalist type of thing. Where you, you like using your business arrangements to like work your way around your competition and get an edge. If that sort of thing interests you, or if you enjoy stories like the... Wolf of Wall Street, or other things like that, where it's all about you know the the business warfare, then Canopus is a great place to be. Uh, next to them is the Torian Concordat. So these guys are a lot of the, the meme is that they're Space Texas. It's kind of like the frontier. They're more I don't want to say low tech because it's not quite accurate, but they're more of the um, less established Wild West kind of vibe. Not necessarily in, like, everybody's out there, like, having duels in the streets with six shooters, but in the sense that it's kind of got this self-reliant, uh, not quite anarchic, but kind of anarchic vibe to it. 
So if you're the type of guy who likes, you know, nobody gets to tell me what to do. I live by my own set of rules and I'm my own man and I do my own things. Torian Concordia, it's a great place to do that. Beyond that is the Marian Hegemony or Marian Hegemony. I don't know how it's pronounced because I've only ever seen it written down. These guys are space pirates, and that's just kind of what they are. They're a whole nation of space pirates. That's about all I can say about it. It's a whole kingdom of it. If you like Pirates of the Caribbean and you want it in space, there you go. These are, these are your guys. These are your boys. Just about anything can happen here. Um, a lot of the side stories and things that people come up with on their own tend to happen in this area as well as the chaos march which comes a little bit later it's similar to that it's almost a lawless area of space where just anything can happen there's technically people in charge there's not a whole lot that they can do to enforce their own things nor do they want to they make their living primarily by preying on cargo ships that pass through their territory so moving on from them you have the outworlds alliance this is kind of the more basic periphery faction. It's one of the more stable, I guess you could say. Um, it's kind of on its last legs in this time period. It's starting to fall apart a little bit, and it will eventually be reformed into the Raven Alliance, which is something very different. It's more of a traditional kingdom type of structure, and not many people choose this one, but it is an interesting place if you want to have that sort of uh, kingdom style to your faction, but you don't really find any of the great houses particularly interesting. It's also a good place to go if you want to have one of the smaller uh, fiefdoms for your character to maybe lord over. If that's, your, if that's your thing, then you can do it in the Outworlds Alliance. You can also go into what's listed here as lesser periphery states. This is just a mishmash of everything you can make up stuff here like this is the here be dragons of the inner sphere if you want to just make something up completely off the wall it's a good place to do that and speaking of making things up we'll talk about the mercenaries so moving on from the main factions of the inner sphere if none of those sounded particularly interesting to you don't give up just yet because there are mercenary units and there are tons and tons of mercenary units so many that even i might say that i'd cover them at a later date in a future video but let's be real there's so goddamn many of them that i wouldn't even be able to start i might cover one or two of the bigger ones at some point but that's one of the other big things that people do and for that i would say uh go to sarna.net and just start looking up the various mercenary units. Now there's different types of mercenary units. Some of them work basically exclusively for one or maybe a couple of the great houses and that's the only place that they'll take contracts from. These tend to be the bigger ones. Uh, you know, units like uh, the Northwind Highlanders for example who have had an exclusivity deal with House Davian for quite a while. So there's just a massive, massive list of mercenary units you can go with but if you want something a bit, you want to pick one of the bigger ones, they're probably going to be aligned with one of the great houses anyway. So even if you like the great houses, but you don't like the way they use their military, you can maybe slip into a mercenary unit that works for them. The other type of mercenary unit is just the pure mercenary. They go wherever the cash is. They don't care who they work for. They don't care what you know the mission is. They're just after the sea bills. These guys are... They can be big, but they tend to be a little bit smaller because if you're you know, a huge unit of troops that has no real loyalties, you kind of tend to make yourself a target for everybody else. Who's, they sort of get nervous about you because that's a lot of troops that they don't have control over. That's not a good thing for them. Not to say that you can't have that, but it tends to be a rarer thing. So these guys tend to be smaller mercenary units, maybe a company or two of troops and battle mechs. And these guys can be found all over the place. This is also where a lot of people tend to make up their own mercenary units, which is something I want to talk about briefly here. Making your own mercenary unit. I'm going to cover this more in depth in a future video, but this is where a lot of people go when they just want to be creative. 
and come up with their own stuff. Mercenaries can go anywhere. They can work for anybody. They can be equipped with anything. They can be themed around whatever you want them to be. So if you are the type of person who likes making their own custom chapter of Space Marines or you know, stuff like that in other tabletop games, then mercenaries are probably the best way to go for you. Because again, they can be whatever you want them to be. That's pretty cool. So we've covered more or less most of the Inner Sphere's biggest factions. So let's say that you find one of these and you really like it, you want to start making units for it. How do you get started? Well, there's a few things that you can do. You can either just, you know, look up what their paint scheme is online. There's kind of a general thing. Or you can pick a specific regiment if you want to get super in-depth. You can find lists of the different regiments for all of the great houses. And even the periphery states will actually have some official records on units that you can use. And those guys will typically have a canon color scheme that you can paint your mechs as. And you'll, you'll find information that will tell you basically everything you need to do to build up that force. So, say for example you want to take... Oh, say the 13th Lyran Regulars. Because you've chosen the Lyran Commonwealth, you want to have a solid uh, House Steiner Regiment. So you look down the list on Sarna.net of all the different regiments that are part of their main body of military. And you just pick one out of the blue, 13th Lyran Regulars. You can look down through the descriptions, and it'll tell you a little bit about their history, where they were, what they did, that kind of thing. Then what I would suggest is taking the information about that unit and going to a website called unitcolorcompendium.com. This place has a list of uh, various paint schemes for almost every faction and almost every regiment unit within the Battletech universe. So from there, you can actually go in and find the specific regiment that you're looking for, and they will have a list of the different paint schemes that they use. They'll have a picture of a battle mech there with the colors that it uses, as well as a list of insignias and which one applies. So like if you want to get uh, decals for your model that match this regiment, you can actually uh, either paint it yourself or you can go to Fighting Piranha, which is another website, and they actually um, will print you off these decals with these designs on them. If you really want to go that in depth, you can order from them and then you can actually put these on your battle mechs. There will be a brief description of you know, in text form of what the paint scheme is and uh, how to apply it. And you've basically got how to do your army right there, all set to go. It's a fantastic resource, and I highly recommend that you give it a try. It's also a good place to go if you're making your own regiment. You can kind of just browse around the site, find what different units are using as paint schemes, and then kind of develop your own as you want. You can kind of get a feel for how battle mechs are painted, how the paint schemes tend to go, maybe find some inspiration for your own designs. So it's a fantastic resource for that reason as well. Highly, highly recommend that you give it a shot. If you want to get super granular, and this is not required by any stretch of the imagination, so don't feel pressured to do this, but if you really want to do this, you can actually pick out like specific mechs and lances for your uh, regiment if you really want to. One of the things you can do is you can actually go on Sarna and you can find lists of battle mechs that are uh, commonplace or maybe even exclusive almost to your faction and you can choose to build your force around them. So from there, once you've got all that information sorted out, you're ready to actually start building your army. Now I'm gonna make another video in the future about uh, how, how to actually get your army started how to build it. But the basics of it is once you know what kind of mechs you want to use, you can begin looking online or in your local stores if your stores have Battletech stuff and you can start picking out the mechs that you want. You don't have to do it that way. If you buy the starter sets or the regular boxes, then your force can be whatever you want it to be because the things in Battletech are fairly ubiquitous. But if you want to make it super themed and keep it like strictly in canon all the time 
you know, these guys only use this type of mech or whatever, then that will help you get those picked out. You can start looking for those and picking them up and just start kind of building your army. So I hope that I've covered a decent amount and maybe, you know, clear things up a little bit about how to pick out your faction, you know, what types of things. And the big thing is to find the theme that you like. So if you are into a certain vibe, like a certain type of culture, that will determine a lot about which faction will probably speak to you. If, if I describe those factions and any of them sound like they'd be cool, do a little more research on them, you know, read up on their history and what their culture is like, and kind of decide for yourself, you know, what, what it is that you're looking for in these factions. So my advice is always find the theme, find that sort of central idea about what each faction is, and then whichever one is your favorite, just go for it. Just dive down the rabbit hole on the wiki and you'll you'll inevitably find something that speaks to you, something that's fun. I can't recommend Sarna.net enough. Those guys are fantastic. Their stuff is pretty well put together most of the time. I actually have done some editing work for them and I really enjoy being a part of that. It's a massive uh, community run wiki. It's possibly the best one in existence. It has got tons of details and you can spend days on end just diving into it. So my advice, if you're looking to pick out your faction, dive straight in. I've given you a starting point. Just dive into that website and follow all the hyperlinks and go between everything. You'll find something in one of those rabbit holes. I guarantee it. So hopefully you guys have got some idea of what to do now. And I look forward to seeing what you guys come up with and what you guys end up putting on the table. Until next time, this is Mage Leader, signing off.